This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, details on a fire that ripped through a home in Wabush early this morning. And now that home is gone. Nothing is left. We were shocked that we would be missing 30,000 liters of our precious water. How do thousands of liters of iceberg water go missing? The company behind Iceberg Vodka fills us in and what they're trying to do next. Ten years since the paper mill in Grand Falls, Windsor closed. A look back at the last decade as the town looks forward. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Our top story tonight, a fire that ripped through a row house in Wabush today. It was intense, ferocious, but thanks to a quick response, the blaze was contained to one unit of the building. Oh my God. Now the call came in early this morning at around 6.30. Residents say flames lit up the sky and smoke quickly blanketed the streets as residents of Anderson Avenue were ushered out of the area. Nearly three dozen firefighters and about half a dozen trucks responded from Wabush and oh. Labrador City. The fire chief says the fire appeared to be contained at the back of the home when he arrived, but it quickly roared out of control. We tried to gain access to attack and it just wasn't safe to do so. So we had to use a piece of equipment to remove one of the walls so we could get sufficient water inside to, to extinguish the flames. The house is essentially destroyed. Luckily for us, between each house there's a fire break wall which is made of uh, cinder block. That helped us contain the fire to the one unit. It was extremely cold. We, we were really challenged with uh, keeping water flowing. Well, the company behind Iceberg Vodka is assessing its stocks tonight after Iceberg Water said to become vodka went missing from tanks in Port Union. Now, the company is baffled about who may have taken it. The RCMP is still looking for the Icebergler. Peter Cowan is looking into the liquid larceny for us tonight. This is what the Iceberg Water was supposed to be turned into, Iceberg Vodka. But when workers arrived at the facility in Port Union on Monday morning, they found empty tanks. There's 30,000 liters of iceberg water that's missing, and the CEO insists there's no chance that somebody just left a tap open. So iceberg water is harvested once. Uh, we go through quite a bit of expense. It takes uh, a good month or so to get the harvest in, uh, and then we bring it to Port Union, and we put it into tanks. We recirculate it to make sure it's always in perfect condition, and so it's under very, very good care, so it's not a matter of just leaving a top on. It would have taken a transport truck to move that much water. Police are asking the public for help for anyone who may have seen something over the weekend. The company can't figure out who would want to take that much iceberg water. There's a little bit that goes into bottled iceberg water. There's a little bit into cosmetics and a little bit into a, a local brewery uh, in Kitty Vitty. So, you know, there are, there are a few sources for it, but, you know, we... We're a small community, we know everybody there, and uh, I can't imagine uh, where that water would be taken and used. Since the news broke of the heist, there have been jokes about leads drying up and markets for hot water, but the police are taking this seriously. Based on the amount of money that the water could be valued at, uh, we take it pretty seriously. So we are doing a full investigation, but uh, it just kind of goes to show that it's always something new every day you come into work here. The company says the water was insured, but it'll likely be May or June before they can go out and harvest any more. They're not expecting that this will disrupt the vodka supply, but the CEO is promising a case or two if a tip leads to this water's safe return. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Well, after a little bit of relief from the winds yesterday, they've picked right back up, especially along the northeast coast. We've got uh, current sustained winds at St. Anthony, about 57 kilometers per hour out of the north. And then for St. John's out of the west, at the same uh, speed there. When you factor in those gusts, though, we're seeing gusts upwards of 70, even 80 kilometers per hour, and that's prompting some wind warnings for this evening. They're actually going to strengthen as we head through uh, the next couple of hours. We've got wind warnings all along 
the northeast coast, that's uh, included in that winter storm warning for the northern peninsula east all the way through to the Bay of Exploits. And then Port of Basque area is going to see those winds pick up again tonight with gusts near 100 kilometers per hour. Otherwise, blowing snow advisories are in place all the way through even to Bonavista as we head through the night tonight. So taking a look at the current satellite radar, we can see all of that snow still uh, for the northern peninsula and the Bayvert Peninsula as well as uh, along the west coast. And as we head through the overnight tonight, eventually we will start to see that snow pull away. We're going to see some along the northeast coast, but then by tomorrow afternoon, bridge of high pressure moves in, keeping things clear up through Labrador as well. I'll have all those details in your full forecast when I come back. Anthony. Thank you, Ashley. A provincial election hasn't been called yet, but campaign promises are starting. PC leader Chess Crosby is taking aim at a tax on auto insurance. Nearly two years ago, the Liberals imposed a 15% tax, and this year, Dwight Ball's government reduced that by two percentage points, taking it down to a 13% tax on insurance premiums. But the Tory leader of the opposition says it's too high, and if elected, he'll scrap that tax. You cannot drive by law uh, without uh, paying the premiums to have your auto insurance intact. And by putting 15% on that, they are making the cost of living for people in this province further out of reach. We're losing population, we're, we're losing young people. It's contributing to the crisis of affordability. I'm all about lower taxes and taking away the 15% added tax on insurance premiums will do more for the affordability of insurance than any scheme to limit the rights of people to claim compensation when they're injured. People in this province are all too familiar with the safety wake-up call that came with the sinking of the Ocean Ranger oil rig 37 years ago tonight. Ahead, what lessons were learned from the 1982 disaster? As more details emerge, a local murder trial is sounding more and more like something out of Hollywood. Today, a second police agent took the stand to testify against his former friend and Vikings Motorcycle Club member. Well, his name and face that can't be reported, but his testimony can. Here now is Arianna Kellen is following the Al Potter murder trial, and she joins us live now from our newsroom. So, Arianna, who is this man, and what role does he play in this? Well, he's 64 years old, used to live in St. John's, and in 2015 became a police agent for the RCMP. Now, a police agent is similar to an informant, except they have to testify in open court using their real name. But before all of this, this man was a full-fledged member of the Vikings Motorcycle Club. Now, what the Vikings and Al Potter didn't know was that the RCMP was paying for this agent's Harley Davidson. His colors, the red and white leather vest, paid for by the RCMP. Same for his club dues, $30 a month. And potentially the most important part in this case, they didn't know he was wearing a wire. He met with police in hotel rooms, places they would refer to as safe houses. There he'd receive instructions on what his task would be. And the whole intent was to find out what happened to Dale Porter in North River a year earlier. Now, in one of the wiretap conversations, the agent asked Potter if he saw news reports about DNA being found in North River. At times, Potter is angered at the media, saying it was printing lies about him. He was worried the Hells Angels would be angry with him for the connections being drawn in the media between Potter and the gang. The jury also heard phone conversations between the agent and Potter while he was serving time in an Ontario jail in 2016. Friendly chats and a job offer. The agent tells Potter he has two friends that want to hire him as a debt collector, a hitman. These two friends, of course, were undercover RCMP officers. The agent even brought them to the Vikings bar on Bonclaudy Street in St. John's to make the whole story seem legit. Now, of course, we know now there was no job offer. It was just a story made up by police. This informer is expected to go back on the stand tomorrow to face cross-examination by the defense. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Arianna Kelland for Here and Now. The St. John's Edge's biggest star has been sidelined indefinitely. Carl English jammed his thumb in a game last week, tearing some ligaments, and that's going to require some surgery to fix. 
With his team in the race for the NBL Canada Championship, that injury couldn't have come at a worse time. Any injury is, is tough to deal with, especially at this stage of my career. Um, and actually the point of the season that we're in, we're, we're at a crucial point here now and finally getting a bit of rhythm after dealing with a couple of nagging injuries this season. Finally felt a bit of rhythm, the team was playing well. Um, so now it's uh, back to the drawing board, see, see recovery times after the surgery and uh, I'll continue to stay in shape and, and be ready for a comeback. Well, Newfoundland man is celebrating a big lottery win in Halifax today. Yeah, and it's all thanks to get this a last minute need for deodorant. Yes, deodorant. <laughs> There you go, Atlantic Lottery bringing out the confetti cannons for Dustin Ellsworth and Mark Boudreaux. Now, Ellsworth, who's from Gross Morn, bought a winning Set for Life ticket last week as a spontaneous purchase at a pharmacy. He plays so rarely he had to ask his mother to confirm the win. They've decided to take a lump sum of $675,000, and that's enough to rip up their mortgage. Went through the papers yesterday because uh, we needed to find something and uh, we just started throwing them all into our shredder box and it's like, oh, we don't need this, we don't yeah. need this. Money's always been a, a worry and there's not a day that goes by that we, that we don't think about our obligations. We just bought our first house last year and um, uh, what it does is it gives a little bit of freedom for us to, to not have those daily worries and to be able to do something special for ourselves and it will enable us to go on a honeymoon that we weren't able to have last year when we got married. Now Ellsworth has done something else many people dream of. Not only will he be debt free, but he also quit his mm -hmm. job. I think there's a, there's a song about that, isn't there? <laughs> wow, what a win. Well, it's been a whole decade since that distinctive whistle in Grand Falls, Windsor Blue. Ten years ago this week, the last piece of paper came out of the Abbott Tibby Mill. It was the end of an era and it led to a lot of changes. Here now's Garrett Berry spoke to some longtime workers and takes a look at this anniversary. And then beyond that was all belonged to the mill. Ten years. It's almost hard to believe. To some it was emotional, but to some they just didn't think it was going to happen, you know, like, I didn't see anybody crying. It's now an empty field, but in that factory, he made his living for 36 years. It was noisy. There was a paper machine running all the time, very noisy. You wear earmuffs. Uh, there was a, a cloud of paper dust, very fine. When the sun was shining, you could see it. That was there 24-7. That didn't leave the mill. And many more besides. One of the things we found was that the mill in Grand Falls reached out across the island employing people. They can seal coal fortune by on the south coast for an example at that time. I think we had 74 loggers and silviculture workers uh, combined. It's a, it's a town of approximately 300 people. Paper makers is Mick Pitt. Its death was far from a surprise, but when the day finally came... The mill at that time had approximately $48 million a year payroll, and it disappeared one morning. People braced for a disaster that never quite got so bad. Uh, it was amazing to watch the, the town grow after the shutdown. I mean, $48 million payroll stopped that morning. And right after that, we had 180 housing starts, I think it was. And there were, there were stores and businesses going up everywhere. The story of this property isn't over yet. Last week, a local heritage group got the keys to that building. And town council already has some ideas about what they're going to do once they get a hold of the land behind these fences. We've got salmon fishing and hunting just across with the Salmon Interpretation Centre as well. So for us, we'd like to tie all that together, take down the chain link fence. We don't want it to look like a wasteland like it has for the last 10 years. And whatever the parameters of development will be, uh, we want to look at that for the best interest of the community. His town still working with the provincial government to get the land handed over. Dreams of a new beginning on land that's already held its share of history. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. We don't have a whole lot of items from post-49 Royal Newfoundland Regiment. A long lost artifact of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment somehow surfaces. We trace the history of this bass drum and how it ended up back with the regiment.
Time for the romantic weather Ooh, forecast. Happy Valentine's Ooh. Day. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know how romantic it is. Oh, well, let, let me help you because I bought you each a box of chocolates. You did? What I mean is I bought one box of chocolates for you <laughs> to, to split, share. To fight over. <laughs> and I, I opened it up to see if it was any good. And, and you made it all. And, well, I, I kept one each for you. So here's Aww. a little heart for you. Oh, my, thank you. And a little heart for you. <laughs> thank you. And I figured eating them all, I did you a favor because I know you guys are watching your figures and oh all that kind of boy. stuff. So anyhow. <laughs> yeah. It was hard. It was hard to keep those two. <laughs> thank you, Anthony. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> it's the least I could do. And I mean least. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, uh, like I said, it's not so romantic of a forecast, I guess, depending on uh, where you are across the province. Those mm -hmm. temperatures today, though, were quite nice this morning, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, we take a look at those. We were pretty warm on the east side of the province, sitting uh, above zero for the Avalon, and then generally seeing those temperatures drop towards the mid minus teens as we head towards the coast and then up through Labrador in the minus teens. Now currently we're have dropped a couple of degrees right across the board, and then with those winds picking up, we're seeing a little bit of a wind chill as well. So feeling closer to minus 13 in St. John's. Uh, not much of a wind chill, though, obviously on the west side of the island, and that's because the winds aren't very strong yet. We will start to see uh, some winds pick up, especially down around the Port of Basque area as we head through the night tonight with gusts near 100 kilometers per hour. So uh, if we take a look at the current satellite and radar, we can see all of that activity happening right now. And those, that's why we still have those winter storm warnings in effect for the Northern Peninsula East all the way through to the Bay of Exploits. There are also some um, blowing snow advisories all the way down through to the Bonavista area. And we will see these uh, blowing snow and windy conditions continue as we head through the night tonight. We've got those wind warnings in place for the Avalon as as well with gusts between 100 and 110 kilometers per hour for exposed areas. Eventually, though, things will clear out, so that's definitely good news. But we are still looking at that potential for flurries through the overnight tonight. Temperatures sitting in the minus single digits, minus 10 for St. Anthony with snow and blowing snow continuing. And then along the west coast as well, north winds 40, gusting 60 uh, for your area. And then Port of Basque should sit around minus five tonight. Now up through Labrador, another uh, generally clear night. We might see a few flurries for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Staying windy though for the Straits. Uh, we're looking at gusts upwards of between 60 and 80 kilometers per hour tonight. Otherwise, another cold night for Lab City sitting around minus 29. Now tomorrow, as I mentioned, things will eventually clear out, but we're still looking at a few flurry potential for the morning, especially uh, for the Avalon with those northwest winds near about 50 kilometers per hour. They will ease into the evening hours, which is certainly good news. And then uh, plenty of sunshine for the south, uh, southern Buren. And then same for Harbor Breton tomorrow, minus two. Again, eventually seeing some clearing. The temperatures are going to drop, though, up through uh, Terra Nova, Twilling Gate as well, down to about minus seven through the afternoon. And then plenty of sunshine and an absolutely gorgeous day as those winds ease along the west coast, sitting between uh, minus one and minus four for Stephenville, a gross morn sitting similar temperature. And then again, minus nine for the Baver for Bayvert. But we are going to see some clearing skies through the day with sunshine all the way up through to Cartwright. And again, those winds will ease through the day minus 10 and then plenty of sunshine for Labrador as well. Minus 14 is your afternoon high for Lab City. Winds just a little breezy, about 15 kilometers per hour, a little bit of a wind chill in the air, and then Nain will sit around minus 15. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look ahead towards the weekend because there's a little bit of a warm up on the way. We'll have all those details coming up. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. Well, a military artifact that's been donated to a local museum is raising more questions than answers. Yeah, kind of an interesting story. The Royal Newfoundland Regiment Museum is the proud owner of an old marching drum, but it doesn't have much information about where this thing came from. Here now, Cease Hare takes a look at this artifact from this province's military past. It was a big day when this marching band bass drum showed up at the doorstep of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment Museum a year ago. We have a lot of uh, artifacts in this museum related to the First World War Regiment and some artifacts related to two artillery units in the Second World War. 
We don't have a whole lot of items from post-49 Royal Newfoundland Regiment, so to have something as special as a bass drum coming to the museum um, got us pretty excited. It came from Tim Shea, who owned it since 2000. He brought it to this province when he returned home to retire last year. The uh, drum actually was uh, a very nice present from my wife. Uh, we were living in London, Ontario at the time, and she came across it uh, uh, in, a, in, in a little antique shop just outside of town. And me, of course, being a Newfoundlander as well as a history buff, she said, that's your gift. Shea gave the drum to a friend who gave it to the museum. He says the tear in the skin was an accident while he had it. He says the rest of the drum's history is a mystery. The uh, dealer that we bought it from back in 2000 had, had, uh, had no prior knowledge of it at all. He, he wasn't even sure where, you know, where he got it. But uh, since I've moved back, been considering the museum, I've done, I've done a lot of um, internet research. So. And what have you uh, come up with? Well, I can share what I've come up with. More, more mysteries. Back at the museum, what little they know comes from archival footage. In one of the clips, you, we think you actually see this drum being used by the 166 Regimental Band in 1957 and in 1959. But you're not sure because those... Well, we're not sure because um, there is nothing on this side of the drum here, on the skin. It first appears in our collection in 1964 during a summer camp being held in Mackesons. And so there's a very clear shot that you, of the drum being played and used during a parade. The museum has wondered if the drum in the two video clips are the same drum. One had no red lettering or caribou applique, but the group using it eventually merged with the regiment in 1961. On the day we visited, that mystery was unraveled by handwriting inside, visible through the tear in the skin. Three different dates, yeah. one from 1951, um, which is unclear uh, who the ownership of the drum is at that point. In 1954, it clearly states the 166 Field Regiment. And then there's a third date in there, 1958, but it's unclear whether why it's there. The bass drummer who was responsible at that time could have written in there, signed his name. A big part of the drum story remains missing and its story before the 1950s is anyone's guess. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. That's so neat. That's fantastic. Yeah, and I love those kinds of stories. Yeah, and it's yeah. actually turned out to be a good thing that mm -hmm. he ripped the drum. Yeah, take a look inside. Yeah, fantastic. And that is the kind of story that Maureen Peters loves to hear. She's the curator of history at the rooms. And she's traveled the province asking people to check their homes for potential artifacts from the First World War, especially the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. And she showed us some of her interesting discoveries. Through these artifacts that come in, it kind of triggers this whole history. Each artifact in the Beaumont Hamill exhibit has a story to tell, not just of its own origin, but also where it was hiding all those years. In people's basements or attics, their significance just waiting to be discovered. That's how Maureen Peters and her team found some historical gems. People came out with the most interesting artifacts and stories. And from that, we built this exhibition. Well, when we were out in Central, when we were twin engaged, we were uh, at the, the uh, inn that's there, and this uh, woman came in with this uh, artificial leg. She got up and she told us the story about how uh, her, uh, her great-grandfather lost his leg in the war, and he, uh, when he came home, this is what he came home with, was this leg, and it's what he used up until when he passed away. Also from the Central area, we, it's a wheelchair. This is a wheelchair, it's a hand crank wheelchair, so that he could, but it, so they can get around. He got this, I believe it was in Brighton, but what he um, found is that it was no good for Newfoundland roads. She says artifacts can show up in unexpected places. One appeared on her own kitchen table. It's an adoption letter from uh, Placentia, and I was just having dinner with my, my mom and dad. My dad pulled out an envelope and said, oh, do you want this? And it was a family member of mine who uh, dad had the First World War medals, and he was one of the first people killed in the First World War. His son uh, never met his father. He was born after his father was serving overseas. And uh, so he was given up for adoption. I was like, yeah, Dad, can you tell me more about this? Because I, I was never told the story growing up. Now I was able to be here in the exhibition. And she's always on the lookout for the next great find. I'm always looking for stuff, and I'm, uh, I'm constantly getting um, offers, like uh, daily. Even on this day. 
So I heard you guys had some artifacts, uh, First World War artifacts that you were thinking about yes, donating my, to us. Yes, our grandfather mm -hmm. uh, was in the First World War and we do have a lot of his uh, military papers. We have a couple of pictures. We would like to donate uh, some of the paperwork and such like that so he can also be registered here oh, at, perfect. at the rooms as well. Mm -hmm. Some finds are more unusual than others. Deep down in the museum vault at the rooms, a very old children's toy. We've never seen anything like this before, but it's actually a First World War doll. And uh, the woman who, who um, collected this bought it because her father fought in the war and she saw it in the secondhand store. It's actually a British soldier, but it was okay. brought, bought here in Newfoundland. And um, because of course we fought with the British, mm -hmm. so we were part of the British uh, Army. It's made with the surge uh, that the, the soldiers' uniforms were made out of. It has the the brass buttons, it even has the, uh, you could tell somebody adapted it <laughs> to be a Newfoundland regiment <laughs> doll. They put, the, they put the, the badges on for the regiment. You can even see how they, they made the puttees to put around his legs. And that came with a little hat. Now it's a bit moth damaged mm -hmm. and the paint is peeling off the doll. But it was just one of those things, she saw it, she wanted somebody to remind her of her, uh, her uh, father and she bought it and then you know 50 odd years later she donates it to us in memory of him and to put in the exhibition eventually. It was just another thing that you kind of don't expect to find. You yeah. know, when you think about the First World War you think about the papers, the images, the medals, you don't think about the dolls and the other things that were for kids to remind them of their dads who were fighting or remind them of their grandfathers who were fighting, remind them of their uncles who were all overseas. So when you get this, this, uh, these items in it really gives you that kind of sense of home and that how the war was perceived at home and how children coped and how it was really encompassing to all the people of Newfoundland Labrador. I wonder what you're going to find next. We get, uh, get offers every day and every day it's like an adventure which we could possibly find in the, to, to help us tell the story of Newfoundland Labrador. That's amazing. Isn't that neat? Yeah. Did you see anything else down there? She there opened all those kinds boxes? of things. Yeah. I remember when they started this when they were waiting for the 100 year anniversary and they went across the province. Mm -hmm. But uh, you never know, you might have something in your attic or something you wonder what it is because I know they're still looking for things. They are always looking for sure. So, so. you might have the next great artifact. Yeah. We'll take a look. And I'm of the view, and many other people are of the view, we have people working out there in our offshore. We should know what's going on. Lessons learned 37 years after the Ocean Ranger disaster, we ask the question, what offshore safety lessons have been learned since?
A horrific anniversary for this province. 37 years ago, during a ferocious storm, the Ocean Ranger sank. 84 crew members killed. Well, this past November, hauntingly reminiscent of 1982, violent winds shook houses in St. John's, and all of Newfoundland and Labrador's offshore facilities were temporarily shut down. On the Hebron platform, the crew was ordered to muster. The Sea Rose FPSO leaked a quarter of a million liters of crude oil, marking this province's largest spill, and Husky only just resumed production two weeks ago. Well, what safety lessons have we learned since the Ocean Ranger? Dan O'Brien tackles that subject with us now. Mr. O'Brien worked on the Ocean Ranger in 1981, and he is a retired Canadian registered safety professional. Mr. O'Brien, let's start off with this. What should we have learned from the Ocean Ranger? Well, I think what it established and what we should have learned is that uh, the Grand Banks of Newfoundland is a very violent area to operate, and it's been known for centuries. And uh, it has been argued quite successfully. It's the most challenging marine environment in the world. Now, as you well know, after that, there was a three-year-long Royal Commission that followed the disaster. And there was a specific recommendation that you're very interested that we should adopt. At least that's what it said. These are performance standards. What are performance standards and why do they matter? Well, a performance standard is defined as a criterion which both qualitatively and quantitatively establishes the equipment and the processes or methodology required to carry out a, a, uh, a task very effectively. All right, and what happened with the performance standards here in, in Newfoundland? Well, uh, they have never been implemented. There's been resistance now by a number of boards since their inception uh, to not go that route. Uh, in fact, uh, there have been interviews done by your people with various chairs, chairmen over the years who said they weren't going to go that route. They were focused on best industry practices and training. Right, and you're talking about chairs of the CNLOPB, I take it. Oh, uh, yes, off, that's right, off the Offshore Petroleum Board, the regulator. All right, we'll come, and, back, uh, we'll come back to the board in a moment. But in Europe, in the North Sea, there was an even deadlier fiasco when the Piper Alpha rig exploded into a ball of flames, 168 people died. This just six years after the Ocean Ranger. What did the European industry do that we didn't? Well, there was a one-year inquiry led by Lord Cullen of the Scottish High Court. He made a number of key recommendations. One was that the responsibility for offshore safety had to be removed from the Department of Energy and set up as a separate entity. And also, uh, Lord Cullen recommended that the performance standards uh, be uh, employed in all aspects of the offshore, all equipment, in, and particularly with evacuation and escape and rescue. And so that's been done. Now, Mr. O'Brien, you are aware of recent incidents in the offshore here in your home province. You've kept an eye on the industry for the better part of 40 years. And you remain somewhat critical towards that CNLOPB that we mentioned, as well as the secrecy of oil companies. What concerns you the most? Well, I'm not really critical of the oil companies. I mean, they're not responsible to me or even the public to report, but certainly the regulator is. And what you receive from the regulator and even from, and from the politicians particularly are very vague. They don't want to disclose any information. And I'm of the view, and many other people are of the view, we have people working out there in our offshore. We should know what's going on. And uh, so uh, the governments, both federal and provincial, who both share the responsibility of the Canada, Newfoundland, Labrador, Offshore Petroleum uh, Board, um, do a very poor job of that. Well, the current politician is, or minister, is Ms. Cody. She stands in the house and talks about, we got this, you have the safest regime, safety regime in the world, and you don't sleep at night unless you know everyone is safe. And then she talks about the board is exceptional. And I, I, I've heard all this before. Right. Any observations about these recent incidents? I mean, you, you've certainly seen them. And I'm talking about what happened in November as well as uh, the incident with the iceberg. Any thoughts on those? Uh, the iceberg got close. I understand within 100, and 100 meters of the ship. And they, they were instruction, the instruction was to prepare for impact. Um, I, I think that's totally unacceptable and I haven't seen any explanation yet and how or why that happened. And then certainly with this uh, uh, leaked 
I assume, and I hate to assume things, but our, I, I think they were in a hurry to get back into production, and of course that backfired on them, and now they've been shut down for several months, meaning lost to the operator, their partners, and also to the governments. When you take a look at the offshore in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, what's your number one concern 37 years after the Ocean Ranger? Well, I think at this point, well, okay, the Offshore Petroleum Board uh, just recently, their, their, their chair, I don't know the man, never met him, he said now they're, uh, they're going to incorporate or employ performance standards in the future. Right, that's Steve now, Kessier. this is a full, yeah, okay, okay, well, this is 34 years after the recommendation has been made. This is a step in the right direction. However, very late, I have to say. The other thing Nate, there needs to be done, of course, is to ensure that these decisions that made the offshore are being done in St. John's. You have to have the people on the ground who are making these decisions. The other recommendations have been made by the Ocean Ranger Commission and by uh, Justice Wells, who held the inquiry on the helicopter accident, cool. that there ought to be a separate entity for offshore safety. And that hasn't been implemented. And it hasn't been mentioned yet. Certainly interesting that here we are so many years after that horrible disaster in Newfoundland Labrador history that we're still talking about what measures should be taken to make the industry safe. It's a very complicated topic. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, I appreciate you uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. I was gathering dust in a living room before getting a second life at Memorial University. A new public piano was unveiled today at the Student Center in St. John's. It's the latest piano installed by the group Business and Arts NL. And as here now Zach Gowdy tells us, the pianos are much more than just pieces of furniture. This is the kind of concert you normally need to buy a ticket for. But at the Munn Student Center, this music is now free. It's all thanks to the donation of a new public piano, courtesy of the group Business and Arts NL. It really can transform a location. Uh, the addition of music uh, inspires people. It uh, just gets a whole focus to the place that it never had before. The piano was unveiled in its new home today. But for many years, it was a cherished part of the Anderson family home. 
The piano's been in my family for almost 60 years. My folks played it, my sister played it, my brother played it, I played it, finally our daughter played it. Uh, but for the last couple of years, it's been sitting there idle, and uh, we were looking for a place for it to go. Take me down. By giving it away, the Andersons have given the piano a new life. Musician Mark Bragg had the honor of playing first. See clear through the chloroform willow. The sound isn't the only thing that draws people to the business and arts pianos. Each is painted by a local artist, inspired by the piano's new surroundings. Artist Mark Benson gave this piano a bright, explosive look, reflective of university life. And he doesn't mind if someone spills coffee on his creation. The more dinged up it gets, it's just going to add to it. It's almost like, uh, like you see paint on my pants here. I can't help but uh, be like, you know, it adds character, people always say, right? Um, and I feel um, people might actually just be a little bit more influenced to sit down and play because they have, might have a connection with the, how visual they, um, the, it looks, you know? This is the sixth public piano that Business and Arts NL has installed. You can find them at the St. John's Airport, Atlantic Place, the Health Science Center, and of course at Munn. More pianos are coming to places like the Goose Bay Airport and the hospitals in Gander and Clarenville. The group hopes to have 15 pianos around the province by year's end. But what they add to these public spaces and the lives of the people in them is harder to measure. Well, it feels nicer. It feels like, you know, you're providing something that would never have been there otherwise. Yeah, kind of um, the barrier between like classical music and like kind of community kind of disappears a little. I'm from Ontario, Windsor, Ontario, and we don't have as many pianos on the street and the airport or stuff like this. So, I mean, it's a great opportunity for people to just sit down and play, right? This new business and arts piano is now available in the Mon Student Center for your playing and listening enjoyment. Zach Gowdy, Super News, St. John's. Zach Gowdy, <laughs> tell you. That's just showing off, Zach. A <laughs> man of many talents. Very talented. Well, staying with uh, lots of talent, Sting performed in Oshawa, Ontario today in support of GM workers who are about to lose their jobs. The musician and actor dropped in with the cast of The Last Ship, a musical now running in nearby Toronto. Sting wrote the music and lyrics for the show. It's based on his own experiences growing up in a community with a dying shipbuilding industry. It's a story he says has parallels to the realities now faced by the GM employees. The car company is closing the plant at the end of the year.
almost a sequel. It's Weather Whiz Kid time. Yeah, it is Weather Whiz Kid time. We take a look at our newest member. It's Jana Dober. She yeah. is actually the twin sister of Mia from earlier, uh, from oh. Tuesday. So she's also six years old, obviously, and from St. Philip. So this mm -hmm. is her photo there. I'm assuming that's her and her sister. That's nice. Uh, in the snowman, so a very different picture. <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of snow coming down. A winter scene, down. yeah. A winter yeah scene. The other one had a tree, right? Mia it did, tree? yeah. That's right. Yeah, and some birds. Right. So there she is there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for yeah. sending that in. And if you, uh, As I recall, she has the same beautiful red hair as her sister. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> which led to a comment about Carolyn's hair, <laughs> which we won't repeat tonight. We don't need to go back there. No, we don't. <laughs> No, but yeah, so if you have or if you want to be a weather whiz kid, uh, send us your uh, drawing and your picture along with how old you are and what uh, where you're from and I'll get you, you a postcard those, in the mail. Those cool membership cards. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, so how's the weather looking for Saturday? We're going to jump okay. ahead to the weekend. It's already Thursday. Uh, we are going to see some cloud cover move in. Uh, first spot that we'll see the snow will be up through Labrador. And then we're going to see the snow into the afternoon on Friday or on Saturday rather along the west coast. Eventually things will change over to snow though or rather to rain as you can see here. Heavy at times potentially as well. Those temperatures are going to jump up above zero probably between three and maybe five degrees through the afternoon on Saturday. And then eventually that will clear out. We'll get into uh, another ridge of high pressure quite quickly on uh, or through the overnight. And then we start to get into the snow squall setup. So just look at your forecast for Saturday. Again, those temperatures sitting above zero five degrees for Corner Brook by the time the afternoon rolls around. Temperatures will climb as well towards the Avalon, but that will happen overnight and into Sunday. Uh, otherwise, we will see that change over up through uh, Labrador, Lab City sitting around minus 10 on uh, Saturday. And then look at these temperatures for Happy Valley Goose Bay and towards the Straits and the coast sitting uh, near just near zero degrees. So minus one for Happy Valley Goose Bay, Nain sitting at minus 13. Now heading uh, into Sunday, as I mentioned, we'll see a quick clear out and then we get into that northwesterly flow which means the potential for some snow squalls will kick in for certainly Monday along the west coast. We could see that for the south coast as well as the Avalon as we head through the day on Monday. Snow sticking around up through Labrador and then uh, into the evening hours and overnight Tuesday. We could see some lingering flurry activity or snow squall potentially along the west coast. Otherwise, things will generally clear out. So here's a look at your forecast over the next five days for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. Again, the potential for some flurries in the morning. Winds will stay strong or will be strong and then eventually ease through the day today or tomorrow. So that's definitely good news. Minus two will be your afternoon high. Saturday, slight chance of you flurries. And then there's that temperature on Sunday, as I mentioned, four degrees by the afternoon with that rain and then uh, potentially seeing those squalls on Monday with a high near minus six and then plenty of sunshine it looks like for Tuesday and minus five for central Newfoundland uh, morning flurries tomorrow again with those winds everything will uh, taper off Saturday looking at uh, snow to rain transition and that's the same thing as we head uh, into western Newfoundland as well with squalls through Monday up through Labrador. We're looking at temperatures around minus 10 tomorrow with plenty of sunshine five to 10 centimeters possible for Saturday and then just a few flurries expected on Sunday. Now for Western Labrador, likely not as much snow. We'll see that cloud move in tomorrow night and then into Saturday, maybe about five centimeters is possible with flurries continuing through Monday. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo when I come back. Carolyn. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Well, despite a growing opposition movement and international pressure, Nicolas Maduro is holding on to power as leader of Venezuela. One reason is his control of the military. Maduro has been showcasing his support from the armed forces in recent weeks, but as the CBC's Adrian Arsenault discovered, support among ordinary soldiers may not be as strong as it appears. Como le va? A Venezuelan soldier who is furious angry enough to talk, and he knows the risk of what he's doing. If they find me doing this, they're going to charge me with treason to the nation. And the consequences for that are torture. So he is tempting torture to say this, that if he's given orders to shoot on crowds, he won't do it. 
I'm incapable of opening fire on my own people. Even my own family could be there. I'm incapable of hurting them. And my companions, I'd say that for the great majority would do the same. I don't think any of them would be capable of gunning down people who can defend themselves. The restraint of some soldiers has been a frequent conversation in Venezuela lately, especially with remarkable scenes recently of National Guardsmen getting hugs from protesters. Ever determined to show the military is on his side, Nicolas Maduro's public relations efforts have been heavily focused on showing his closeness to the military. Last week, even getting a medal pinned to him, although listen carefully to the exchange of a soldier. With or without blood, he jests. Perhaps not so much of a joke. If Maduro fears some sort of insurrection, then this soldier may understand why. <laughs> they know they're losing. They know they have no way to control this. They know that people don't believe in their lies anymore. They know that the armed forces are split and that a large number support Juan Guaido. His complaints, he says, are like those of so many others in the country. Not enough money to feed the families, not enough security or promise. That may be so for many of the rank and file, but they take orders on the upper echelons of the forces. And those are people protected by Maduro's government. They live happily. They live in three-story houses. They have all the luxuries. They get a hold of all the things you can get in this country. They have access to everything, everything. Everything from food, medicine, private clinics, doctors. They travel. Even so, bottom line, can Nicolas Maduro count on the armed forces to protect him and his government? One man's view. The government can depend on the armed forces. If it's a good government, if it's a fair government, if it's an honorable government. But this government, like this now, can count on the armed forces. He says that and yet knows his risky to articulate analysis may amount to nothing. There have been a lot of bold statements about and by the opposition in Venezuela over the last month, and yet, Nicolas Maduro remains, his grip remains. The story of the opposition is so far just one of words, not many deeds. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Caracas. Running out of time. Yes. 
get right to the weather photo then. All right. All right. Look at this one. It's absolutely stunning photo. Any idea where that one's taken? Uh, okay. Ooh, I think no. I've seen that. Um, South Coast. South. Yeah. What's the building there? I'm not going to give you time. No. <laughs> it's in Ramia. Ramia. Oh, yeah. Nice. Ah, well, I haven't been there. A gorgeous. I never. I didn't know what it looked like, and this is a, a beautiful uh, shot there. Thank you so much for sending that in, Joanne Keeping. Beautiful Lovely. view. I can imagine just yeah. seeing that. We come home here, too. Yeah. This summer? Apparently. Oh, yeah. there come you go. You're in Ramia. It's beautiful in the winter, but uh, probably even more beautiful <laughs> in the summer. In the summer. Absolutely. Like Got to get a boat to get there. Yes, true. Unless you own your own chopper, which few of us do. <laughs> One day. <laughs> it's great to get pictures from areas that we don't normally exactly. get pictures from. Don't yeah. get too many from Ramia. Nope. So beautiful part of the you. province. Happy Valentine's night or Galentine's or yeah. whatever you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have a great night, everyone. Good yeah. night. See ya.